Hey, aloha and welcome to Stanley Energy Man on another beautiful Friday in Hawaii. And uh, happy uh, Independence Day uh, in the 5th today. Yesterday was 4th of July. Great day. Great, great uh, events in D.C. Good flybys. I like flybys. That's probably why I like the event so much. And um, just thanks to all the veterans and to uh, all the folks that uh, celebrated and had a good time. Uh, thanks to Hank Rogers for letting some uh, energy folks up to his place to watch the fireworks from uh, his nice viewpoint. And um, just uh, if you didn't catch the special show that, that Jay and Chief Westcott Lee and I did for 4th of July on Wednesday, it's now on YouTube and you can catch it on YouTube. And uh, that might be entertaining, at least uh, for those of you that are, are patriots and want to check that out. Anyway, today's uh, show is, is going to focus back here in Hawaii on a, a subject that we don't really talk too much about, and that's uh, wind power and also, in general, what's going on in energy in the legislature. We're going to talk a little bit about both, but we, we hardly ever talk about wind power here, and it's certainly something that's, uh, that's been looked at over the years here in Honolulu and, um, and on the neighbor islands, and um, we, we just kind of want to talk to a little bit more in depth about it. So today we have a very special guest, Senator Gil Riviere from the North Shore. He's got... Uh, Probably one of the biggest districts in the in the, in the state. Uh, maybe some bigger ones on the Big Island, but uh, for Oahu, for sure, one of the biggest districts, and where the wind turbines happen to be. So we'll be talking to him about some legislation and uh, the wind turbines and the impact on his constituents. So, Senator, thanks for being on board here today. Thanks, Appreciate Dan. It. Thanks for having me on board. So I've been on your show at the mm -hmm. Senate uh, over there, and uh, you've been on here, I think, at least once. Yep. So. We, we, can we catch up a little bit? This last, last session, we had a couple of bills come through that I know helped the hydrogen guys, which I'm, I'm really thankful for. Um, so I know that we have now the definition of electric vehicle includes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And uh, I know that the hydrogen, um, what they call it, special fund or a rotating special fund or whatever, got embedded in some uh, language that's uh, making high tech development corporation into a, a more robust corporation reorganizing some things under DBED. So those were two things that I was really happy to see, and I, I kind of missed a bunch of the other stuff. Was Is there anything special that pops out in your mind that uh, energy-wise that you thought was really uh, a special this time? Um, probably the biggest change was the uh, kind of the reshuffling of the energy office. There's now a, a Hawaii State Energy Office, which is a reconfiguration, basically. Mm -hmm. It takes it out of the hands of the director uh, of DBED of directly. DBED. Mm -hmm. And um, that... Um, it's probably a good thing, probably a good thing to, to focus an office directly on that instead of um, having it just uh, subsumed into the larger EBED. So, Did the legislature have, I mean, besides restructuring, have more direction in mind for them? Like, did they want them to, they've been kind of an advisory and a um, status, statistical office gathering a lot of energy data and providing some policy guidance to the executive branch. Does the legislature... I kind of want to expand that. Is that part of the? Well, there's a new new um, chair of the Senate Energy Committee this year. Senator Wakai took over, and I think he's got a different focus on it. He's more um, kind of task oriented, and, and he he's got a vision for it that I imagine we'll be seeing some refinements coming over the next year or two okay. to address and fill in those um, kind of areas that maybe are left yeah. to be resolved. Maybe I should drag him on the show. And, yeah, you probably and, should and grill him personally. Yeah. Okay, that'll be good. Well, looking forward, you know, as a, as a state senator, I know there's hundreds of bills that go through the legislature and probably dozens and dozens that are energy related. But do you get a sense overall that the, the, the reps and the senators and, that are in, on board now um, have, have a kind of a vision for the future energy wise? Or, I mean, have, have they been energized by the climate change discussion and, you know, all, the, all that? Have, have, and can you see looking forward whether we're going to put more emphasis on really trying to move to clean energy? I think, I think it's um, very clear that we're moving towards clean energy. Um, I actually pause when I say that because I, I, sometimes I think we, we rush headlong without mm -hmm. actually exactly. looking into the details and the impacts. So I think, I think the consensus is, yes, let's do more and more and more for clean energy. But I think is missing is the critical uh, weighing of the pros and cons. I agree. In fact, I, I criticized um, some of the actions yes, uh, this week when I talked about the, um, the patriotic show saying we've, we've lost the art of critical thinking. And um, we tend to 
uh, go into too many things with the first order effect in our face and go, that's it, and forget that there's second, third, fourth order effects that may not be so good and we, we need to avoid. Here's an example. There was, a, there was an agency official who was, um, we are in the middle of a, a debate, let's say, and this person said, but everybody wants to get to clean energy and, and you've seen the movies on climate change and every one of those movies, they have windmills as the solution. So how do you argue against that? And that's my, I think, yeah. I think it's clear that that's not a very um, scientific right. yeah. uh, review of the data. It's, yeah. a, it's a wishful thinking when you say, well, that's, that's the answer. Let's go there no matter what. Yeah. And, and some solutions that work in one location don't work in other locations. Correct. You know, I mean, there's, there's different geologies. There's different um, climates. There's all kinds of things that impact what choices you have. In fact, the work that we do with the Air Force, you know, we, our work has to be able to be demonstrated in the Arctic, in the desert, in high altitude, in sea level in high salt environments, in real dry environments, in real wet environments. I mean, we have to do everything and figure it out and test everything before we say, yeah, well, we're going to go with that technology. Right, because each of those environments uh, has different side effects. Uh, for example, um, you, you mentioned windmills, and we have windmills. Well, we have 100 megawatts of a nameplate value, which means on a perfect day, um, with perfect winds consistently blowing, we could potentially have 100 megawatts of power. Mm -hmm coming out of our district. That doesn't happen because the, the winds are not always blowing perfectly and, and they change. And on, on average, you get about 30% of what they, what they advertise. Right, of the rated, yeah. So here we have uh, windmills and people are saying, yeah, 100 megawatts, but it's not really 100 megawatts. It's, it's a third of that mm -hmm. on, on average. And you notice that they don't have windmills on Kauai. They say, well, why? Well, because there's too many endangered species, too many mm -hmm. endangered birds on Kauai. Well, we've got endangered uh, uh, Opeapea, the Hawaiian hoary bat here. And the wind turbines throughout the state on the three islands where they do exist have grossly exceeded their allowable take okay. on the Hawaiian hoary bat. So we have to look more carefully at that. We can't just keep turning a blind eye. Right. And uh, this is one of the things I feel very strongly about. Yeah, in our background today, we have the wind turbines over on Maui, and I was there for a, a, a talk with some, uh, with some media and with the folks that run those, those turbines. And um, they, they were focused on the ecological piece. And they've actually set up rookeries for endangered birds. They have for bird the dogs. Dana and for yeah. some of the birds. And, right? and they have bird dogs that go out every day underneath those turbines to look for dead, dead critters, dead birds, bats, whatever. And they even test the bird dogs. They'll throw out stuff. They'll plant stuff to see if they catch them. So their data over there, I think, is, is pretty good. And they've, they've actually found that, that there is a lot of mortality there, a lot more than they expected anyway. They have a process for um, searching. Uh, they don't go every day, I don't believe. I think they... No, when, I, when I visited them, they said they went every day or they tested every day. They tested the dogs and, every day. And then what they do, uh, Kauai Loa is an example above Waimea Bay. Mm -hmm. They had a search area. Um, the turbines are 150 meters tall, 130 mm -hmm. meters, I forget. They're, they're 500 feet tall, basically. And they had a search area where they would go out 100, 150 meters. Well, after the first year or two of searching... They now only search out to 75 meters. That doesn't make sense. Because they said they've done their initial study and analysis, and therefore they only need to go 75 meters. Now think about how tall yeah. the turbine is twice as tall as the, uh, the, the radius uh, that they're searching. Um, they say, yeah, but we take that into uh, mathematical effect, because if we find a, uh, a dead animal, uh, it'll count for more than just one. So we do statistical analysis. But my question is, yeah, but if you don't find any, then you can't add yeah. that factor to yeah. it. So I'm not a scientist, and I don't, I don't pretend to, to go there, but there's just some, yeah. some curiosities Those like that. Old figures never lie, but liars figure kind you, of deal. I, I, you know, <clears throat> there are people that are very dedicated, very devoted in the Endangered Species Recovery Committee. They're biologists, and they know their numbers. But it just seems odd to me that yeah. if you have a situation like today where there are... Um, far greater numbers of death of bats, that you shouldn't be reducing the search and saying you'll make up for it yeah. statistically. It seems to me you should, that should warrant a more um, detailed sure. and, and bigger searches. I've watched, um, uh, m these are mainland species like hawks and things, and they play in the wind turbine. 
and they get hit, but they don't get hit 75 feet from the base of the tower. They get hit out near the ends of the blades, which is probably more than 75 feet out. And not only that, but the wind is blowing, and it blows them even further away from the, tur the tower than when they got hit. So if you're only looking 75 feet around the tower, you're definitely not picking up everything. Um, there, there's 75 meters, and then there's so, sometimes they're built on hills. Kahiava sure. is built on a hill, so it's, it's difficult to search exactly. down below. It's difficult to search downwind. Pakini Nui has a concern now where they're uh, coming in. This is uh, near South Point, and they're working on having a, and instead of a, a complete circle for search, they, they're taking into effect the downwind area, and, right. and they're going to search a greater area. So those are some of the improvements that we are seeing. Okay, good. And, and I'm happy to say that over the last several years that I've become aware of these problems and been tracking, uh, the Endangered Species, Re uh, the ESRC, the Recovery Committee, they are doing a much, much better job. So I, okay, I do good. think we should give them credit for really, really standing up and uh, doing a better job these days. Yeah. I mean, as long as they're really being practical and objective about doing the searches, it makes sense. But just to sit there and arbitrarily say, Here's our circle, and that's all we're going to do. And if it's 76 yeah. meters out, that doesn't count. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's not, that's yeah. not, it doesn't go on their that, numbers. That doesn't go. My bird dog doesn't search only within a meter. Yeah. It, it smells something, it goes for it. And mm -hmm. it won't go down steep terrain. I mean, she'll go down no, there, but can't. I won't go down well, there. Well, you can't because it's, not, it's yeah, not safe. I, I don't want and her to bat, go down there. Bats only weigh a couple ounces. Yeah. And so their persistence is only a few yeah. days, and they won't last more than a week, no matter what. Right. And if a mongoose gets to it before the search animal, um, yeah. It's hard to hard to say. So. Yeah, and most people don't see many bats in Hawaii, but I have property on the Big Island, and I, I can guarantee you every night that when the sun goes down, I can sit there and watch the bats flying around catching insects and stuff mm -hmm. right off my, my lanai, and um, they're there. You don't see them because they're nocturnal, and um, my, my cabin where it's at is really dark, but just the, the night sky behind it, you can see them, and you can tell they're bats because of the way they fly. And they're not real big, so like you say, they could be in the gr hit the ground, and you know, mongoose could pick them up, and, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. But they're there, and it is a, it is an issue. So I'm glad they're at least you know improving their techniques to, to make sure they We're recover. Pressing them, I'm pressing yeah. them hard, Good. as hard as I can. But, but that's only one issue. Um, I know when I talked to you earlier about uh, wind turbines, uh, you initially told me that your the folks on the North Shore were willing to give it a shot because the the electric utilities and the contractors made a good case about not impacting. But then the red lights on top of the towers were just flashing all night long in people's windows, and they had to shut the, I mean, literally put blinds in so they could sleep. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, noise becomes an issue, too. So can you just refresh me on some of those issues? Yeah, a, co a couple of things. Uh, a few weeks ago, my, um, my wife's niece was in town, so we went back up into Waimea Valley. And if you've been back in there in the last few years, as you get towards the waterfalls, you will hear a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And, and, and people don't necessarily know what it is. They think there's something going on, but they don't recognize. It's the turbines that are yeah. towering over the turbine. The gentleman, uh, one of the gentlemen that I mentioned to you previously with the red light, um, I called him just last week because a Christian Science Monitor reporter was in town, and, I, and she was asking, do you know anybody that have comments about windmills? And I said, of course I do. And I called this gentleman, and he said he's too upset. He can't take it anymore. He's tried. He's spoken. He's spoken out against it. But the red lights and the noise and everything is just, just, just drives him crazy. And at this point, he can no longer um, calmly speak Discuss about the it. issue. It's just been wearing on well, him. Maybe that's the, the kind of person you need to have years. in front of a reporter then. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I, I'm sure that the utilities you know, they're trying to do the right thing. Um, but bottom line is they're selling a product. They have and, a mandate. Uh, Hawaiian yeah. Electric has a mandate. You see the state has a mandate to deliver more renewable energy. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be centralized power from inefficient wind turbines that generate. The ones above Waimea, those generate only 22% of their wow. nameplate value. So they are complaining that they can almost never turn them off because they can't generate enough electricity. Mm -hmm. But the point is, when the turbines operate at a slow wind speed, the bats are more likely to be prevalent. Exactly. So it all circles back to it's not the right product for that place. That environment. Yeah. Right. We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back in 60 seconds to spend some more time with Senator Rivera. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. 
My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man on my lunch hour, at least for a couple more weeks when I depart state employment and become a fully retired gentleman. Then I can come on Think Tech whenever the heck I want. So uh, thanks for joining us again. And we've got Senator Gil Rivera from the North Shore, and we're talking wind turbines. And, you know, are they all good? Are they the right thing for Hawaii? And you've mentioned a couple times about the rated output of the turbines and talking between 20 and 30 percent rated output on, on an average day. Um, I think that there's a couple points being missed by a lot of people. And that's one of them. You're not getting even 50 percent most of the time. Those things, I think, op like to operate around 30 knots or so, somewhere in that range. And we average like 15 to 18 knots of trade winds most of the time but not all the time for sure. And it dr drops off a little at night. But the other thing is, when the utility has to use wind or any intermittent, even solar, and it starts going up and down because the wind speed changes, that's not good. The utility doesn't like that. And so they'll curtail uh, renewable re energy because they don't want it messing with their, their um, stability on the grid. So they'll actually curtail, even, even though those wind turbines aren't putting out 100%, and they're in the, only in the 20, 30 percent uh, productivity. Then they'll curtail them another 20 percent, you know, and tell them shut a couple down because you're destabilizing our grid. So there's a there's other issues that the utility has to deal with um, with that technology that's usually not talked about much. And um, so let's go back to the gentleman that had the red light flashing in, in his bedroom window every night. Um, and you said he was really upset and was so upset he. he really didn't even want to talk to reporters anymore. You know, in his mind, he was living in a nice, pristine place with a great view, and, and that was his home, and he settled in, and he, he invested money in it. He's got, you know, improvements on the property, and now he probably wants to move, but where's he going to move to? And, you know, is that the right thing that we should be doing to our folks? And for tourism, do tourists really want to come here and see wind farms all over our mountains? I personally don't think so. I certainly don't. And I know when we started talking about Maui and Molokai doing a lot of wind turbines and then putting undersea cable to Oahu, that went over like a lead balloon. You know, it's like, why should people on neighbor islands give power to Oahu and go through all the expense and everything and mess up their view on mountains and things like that? So we uh, on the North Shore um, were supportive of the ideal of wind energy. And we were welcoming of it in 2010 when the uh, wheels were turning and it came. And we asked questions like, what will it look like? And the sales rep, I swear, he said, oh, those folks that live up in Pupu K are going to have the best view. Yeah, no kidding. Those are the ones with the red lights that they can't sleep at night. Um, and they said, well, you'll see them just because they're so tall. When you're down by the beach at Chun's and Laniakea, you'll be able to just see the tops of them over the, over the poly there, the hill. And, uh, but that's not true. You see them from everywhere. You can't yeah. miss them. And so we feel, many people on the North Shore feel like we were uh, betrayed on, on the visual impact, the impact. Uh, we thought there would be more energy. We didn't think there would be the, uh, you know, the uh, effects on endangered species. Um, and the folks who live in Kahuku have had windmills longer than just about anybody. Mm -hmm. um, they accepted, you know, the, the first wind farm on right. Oahu in this new generation of wind energy. 
And now they're looking at getting another wind farm on the other side of town. So they will be completely surrounded by wind turbines. And there is a concept called environmental justice, which says that it's unreasonable to dump things onto a small community because they can't defend themselves. Right. And I've been bringing this up again and again, that it is unreasonable for Kahuku to have more windmills when they really don't want them. And the turbines that are there now are 428 feet tall. Mm -hmm. The ones that are proposed that are going to be next to the high school and on the other side of town, instead of 428 feet, they're going to be 568 feet tall. The tallest building in this town is 428 feet. Right. If you put one of these things up against Diamond Head, it'd be just about as tall as Diamond Head. Yeah. They're, they're, they're gargantuan. And yeah. they're going to, some of the houses may have shadow flicker, which means that the, the, if you've ever seen a, a yeah. fan between, behind a light, it flickers, uh, but the wind company said, that's okay, it's only gonna be a couple, few minutes a day on certain days. Depending where um, the sun Which goes is back to your point about your quality of life, and did, did, they, did they sign up for that? What, how yeah. do they benefit? How do the people of Kahuku benefit? Exactly. So the wind developer has said that they will give $10,000 per year per turbine. Now, originally they were proposing 14 turbines with the potential to expand beyond that. Now they're down to eight turbines. And so instead of 140,000, which was originally conceived, now they're offering 80,000 to the community because they reduce the number of mm -hmm. turbines. But they're going to make the same amount of electricity and the same amount of profit, and they're going to make more, but they're just giving less to the community. So these are the things that I just think are terribly unfair. And when I bring it up to folks, I mention that the greatest wind resource on this island is right offshore Diamond Head. That's where the most wind is. The most mm -hmm. consistent winds are just offshore Diamond Head. And I say, why don't we put a wind turbines off a of diamond head? Ooh, can't do that. And people laugh. They, they, they involuntarily laugh. And I say, that's my point. Yeah. So why do, why do the Kahuku people have to have them when you're not willing to have them it. in Kahala? Yeah. So th that's part of the equation. Yeah. But they're just not generating the electricity. Uh, and at great expense, the Kauai Loa wind turbines are 23 cents. Per or megawatt. Or, or, or per megawatt to yeah. build them? Okay. Yeah. No, to, that's what they're selling. Is that, oh, Per kilowatt 20, hour? Per kilowatt hour, yeah. That's, yeah, it's not, it's, that's 23 cents. Yeah. 20, that's, that's outrageous, you know. Um, we're that's, not, and that was sold back when they said, but it's guaranteed you can go to market, guarantee oil is going to be $200 a barrel, and this is going to save us money someday. It's not saving us money now. It's not going to save us money. Not in the near future. So our electricity rates go up. We're yeah. endangered species, the visual blight. The noise and, and everything else. And I think a lot of the funding models for these um, wind turbines are based on uh, federal tax subsidies or, or, or tax breaks. Right, they can't afford to build them without yeah. the massive tax and infusions. So, you know, so we're, we're paying taxes on the federal side that are subsidizing the construction of these things, and they're still charging 20-something cents a kilowatt hour. I, I think when we had net metering, the electric company would pay 19 cents a kilowatt hour to a residence that, that was giving them power mm -hmm. back when they would pay them. Mm -hmm. um, th this, this all bothers me a lot because, you know, if we're curtailing power and Hawaiian Electric's paying somebody to curtail power, but they're getting the money from me to pay somebody not to produce power. I, it's free, yeah, free energy, I, right? It's, I, yeah. it's wind, it's free, and it's renewable. This, this math isn't working out for me, and I'm, I'm not a rocket scientist, but uh, basic math doesn't, doesn't fa fare out. And, you know, to your point about the height of these turbines and the size of my son and I used to do a lot of fishing off of Kaneohe and the windward side. We can see those turbines, the ones that were in Kuhuku, we can see them from over 20 miles out at sea. Because the, the buoys out on that side, U buoy and, and um, LL, they're, they're, they're out there because the water's, you know, not as deep as off Waianae side. And so we'd have to go pretty far out to go to the fishing grounds. And we could easily see the turbines from that far out. And, and I think there's talk about putting turbines in the ocean, uh, like you saw off Kaino Point in that area. And they're, they're going to be probably no farther than 12 miles out because that's the international limit, outer limit. There's a three-mile limit, there's a 12-mile limit, and then there's a 200-mile EEZ. But at 12 miles, you're still going to see the turbines. And the water is so deep out there, it's... You know, at that distance out, it's probably over two miles deep, maybe three miles deep, because only a mile offshore of Waianae is a mile deep. The, water, the, the, the shore drops off really fast out there. So how are you going to land cables? I mean, on the, in the Great North Sea, where they got a lot of wind turbines, 
it, it ain't a mile deep water. It's, it's relatively shallow. And they can anchor those, those units to they the... They build them like an oil rig. Yeah, they, they, they can just, anchor they, them right to the bottom. Right. So what are they going to do with these things at 12 miles out where it's three miles deep or two and a half miles deep? The ones they're proposing are, I think, as close as seven miles, seven or eight miles to and a point, mm -hmm. which, as you said, are going to be highly visible. They're going to be 700 feet tall uh, or possibly taller. Which is almost twice as big as any building we have at home. And they'll be right in, in yeah, they'll be right in the, the migratory path between Oahu and Kauai. They'll be visible from anywhere that can, can see that area. They also want to put posts, so there's, there's Kaena Point, but also off of uh, Barbara's Point. Mm -hmm. They want to, uh, off the south shore. So anybody sitting in Waikiki watching the sunset will have a great view of the, of, turbines. Of the turbines when they're watching the sunset. So I don't know how that's going to go down for visual. Maybe, maybe in Holland, but yeah. not in Waikiki. So these are a problem. The, the cables and the chains that are going to be required will be massive. There'll be a massive network mm -hmm. of cables and chains. And uh, it's not going to be good for um, the whales, the migratory whales that frequent those waters. It's not going to be good for the Navy who has to operate in these waters. Right. So um, a lot of problems with it. A lot of technical issues. Uh, I know our community is 100% against uh, putting those things offshore. Well, I'm glad you're in the, in the legislature so that when these things come up, there's at least one voice that's uh, looked beyond the first order of good feelings and great intentions, you know. But, uh, you know, it, it may not be the right place for, for wind yeah, turbines. Yeah, turbines, uh, turbines may work in other places where there, there's less sure. environmental take and, mm -hmm. and side effects. You know, they say every, every magic has its price. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the price of turbines in Hawaii um, is too high. Well, I, I know I, I went to Texas about two years ago, and they produce 20% of their electricity from wind turbines in mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. And they average between two and eight cents a kilowatt hour. Right. And they can make a profit at four cents a kilowatt hour off a of wind turbine. Um, that's a far cry from what you just talked about in the 20 cents a kilowatt hour to, to put them up and, and run them. So. The Palehua project up above Makakilo, I th think they're talking about something like 10 cents. Mm -hmm. So it's, they're, they're, it's bending the curve there on the cost. But once again, now the people in Nanakuli got to deal with uh, looking at those turbines um, and inefficiencies. That, and they, okay. yeah. Well, believe it or not, we blasted through 30 minutes mm -hmm. already. And I want to thank you for the advocacy you, you put forward in the legislature. And uh, I know your constituents will keep voting for you as long as you keep doing what you're doing. Um, because it's tough to be a small community and not have your voice heard. So thanks for doing what you do. Appreciate it. Thank you, Stan. It. Thanks for having me on the show today. Sure. It's been fun. Anytime. And so until next week, see you next week on Stan Energy Man. Aloha.